Aloha and welcome to Power Up Hawaii. I am your host, Raya Salter. I'm an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. I'm also principal of Imagine Power LLC. Thank you so much for joining me today. Today, we are here to talk about clean and renewable energy for everyone. This is closer to becoming a reality in California and hopefully very soon here in Hawaii. I've worked as a private attorney and a clean energy advocate for 10 years. In that time, a lot has changed in clean energy technology. More and more companies and homeowners have been buying or leasing rooftop solar. This has led to tremendous and encouraging growth in the clean energy market at a time when we need to move away from fossil fuel. This boom, however, has not happened across society equally in America as a whole. People who live in rental housing or otherwise don't own or control their property have not been able to see um, the benefits of solar energy. Similarly, people with low incomes have not seen the benefit of clean energy. This means that clean energy is seen like it is only for the wealthy. However, if we are to make the switch to clean energy, all of society must participate. This transition cannot be done by the wealthy alone. Enter community renewables. Today in the news, it is in the news that the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power has voted to move ahead with a solar program aimed at bringing access to low-income customers, for uh, renewable energy access for low-income customers. Thus far in Hawaii, distributed renewable energy systems, such as PV systems, have only been available to those who can afford the significant upfront cash payment required for a system installation. A community-based renewable program provides an alternate means of investing in renewable energy to individuals and groups like schools or community organizations who may be otherwise precluded from installing their own systems. So what might this look like? I think we've got a picture of what a community renewable energy system looks like. So there you've got in the middle the community solar garden. There are means, there are supports, incentives, and tax credits that, are, um, that go in to help this work financially. And then you've got um, several people who can offtake from that particular um, garden. And it can also be sold back to the utility. So on June 8th, 2015, Governor David Ige signed into law Act 100, which requires Hawaii's electric utilities to create a renewable -based, community renewable-based program. This process is ongoing and has not yet resulted in a completed tariff as yet. Here we've got a picture of what solar can look like on a multifamily building. So this is a project is in Wisconsin. So this is something that can and has been done. California is a state that has made tremendous strides in community-based renewable energy programs. To talk about this progress and what it can mean for Hawaii, I am joined by Skype by Jorge Madrid. Jorge is campaign manager, energy and climate for the Environmental Defense Fund and is based in Los Angeles. Jorge is a nationally recognized voice on climate equity issues and works to ensure clean energy policies and inclusive and, are inclusive and benefit all communities, particularly low-income communities and people of color. He holds a master's in urban planning and public administration for the University of Southern California. Welcome, Jorge. Hello, Raya. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. So, Jorge, awesome news coming out of California and Utility Dive and in the LA Times today. Can you please explain what happened with this latest vote and what this means for community renewables in California? Sure, Raya, and thanks again for having me. Um, I think what's really important is that we took a first step, a much needed first step here in Los Angeles. Now, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power is the largest municipally owned utility in the country, uh, serving about 4 million customers. And uh, as you mentioned in California and in Los Angeles in particular, we've had really tremendous strides in installing solar. We have more solar installed than anybody in the country but as you mentioned, a lot of it is concentrated in wealthy homeowners. Um, at the recent vote of the board, we approved a new pilot project to extend uh, what we're calling a solar leasing program. The program is actually called the Solar Rooftops Program. Uh, it's going to be a relatively small pilot with about 400 homes, roughly about one megawatt of solar. The department is going to install solar on these homes at no cost. Uh, and maintain the panels 
and the customer is essentially leasing the roof space and is going to receive about a $30 per month credit on their bill. Interesting. Why are community renewables important and why are they important in California? I think as you mentioned and what's really important about as we transition to a new clean energy economy, we have to understand that everyone needs to participate. Um, and in a market like Los Angeles, you have about 55% uh, of all residents are renters. Um, and that is um, usually going to be low income communities, usually communities of color uh, who are going to fall into that demographic. Uh, and because of that, large swaths of the community have not, have essentially been locked out of the market. Mm. Um, and I think when we talk about the success of our solar programs in California and in Los Angeles, we have to understand that we designed them to really favor uh, upper, mid upper and middle income homeowners uh, who have good credit scores, who have a roof that can support solar system, uh, that, and actually have uh, upfront capital to spend. Uh, and that really doesn't fit the profile of a lot of families in Los Angeles uh, and really in cities across the country. So that this is going to be a really important way to extend access, uh, but also a California and the city of Los Angeles to meet its uh, extremely ambitious renewable energy goals. Um, and I think the other thing to remember is that we need lots of tools in our toolbox in order to achieve that. This is certainly going to be one of them and one that we're very excited about. Oh, that is awesome. And uh, it is exciting that California has such ambitious RPS. Hawaii also has um, extremely ambitious goals for um, clean and renewable energy. Let me ask, how can communities, in um, particular low-income communities and people of color, benefit from having access to clean and renewable energy? So one of the things to look at is a average low-income family, a typical low-income family, and, and we know that there's a strong correlation between being low income and being the person of color in the United States. So there's already a connection there. But a typical low income family is going to spend between seven, upwards of 20% of their monthly income on energy costs, um, depending on where you are in, this, in, in what kind of climate zone you're living in and what kind of housing you have. But that's a significant chunk, especially for a, a family that's already just getting by. Um, so to free up those resources by reducing the cost of energy, and, and, and I want to point out, it's not necessarily just cheap energy. What it is, is stable energy costs. One of the things we know about solar power uh, is that we can, you know, predict the amount of uh, energy that we can produce on a given rooftop solar system and really be able to build that into a family's budget. So there's monetary savings. Um, one of the important parts of the Los Angeles program is that there's also a workforce development, jobs development program associated with it. Oh, please, so, tell, us, tell us about this program for you. Absolutely. Um, so the Los Angeles Department of Water Power probably has, in my mind, one of the more impressive job development programs called the uh, Union Precraft Training Program, the UPCT. Um, and what it does is it brings in folks who uh, come from traditionally disadvantaged backgrounds, people who've been formerly incarcerated, mm -hmm. folks who maybe only achieved a high school equivalency degree, um, but who want to work and who want to, you know, improve the city. Uh, and it really sort of creates this pipeline of people into the Department of Water and Power. And those are going to be the folks actually installing the solar um, in part of this program. Um, so that's going to be another way that it could benefit the communities. And lastly, um, you know, in Los Angeles, we're lucky. We don't have a lot of coal-fired power plants. Uh, but what we do have is a lot of peaker power plants. And mm. those are plants that we flip on when the weather gets really hot, when we need uh, more energy than we're normally producing. And those power plants are extremely polluting. Um, and they create not only greenhouse gases, but a lot of other coal pollutants. And more than likely, those power plants are located in low-income communities of color. So you sort of have this um, solution that's going to help alleviate costs, it's going to create jobs, and it's going to reduce local pollution. Oh, that is fantastic. And I know that those are all things um, that we here in Hawaii would also like to see happen. Why don't, Jorge, go ahead and tell us, what type of, of work have you and EDF been doing in California? on uh, community renewables? So EDF is really interested in opening up new markets for clean energy. 
And so we really feel that you know, using uh, these market forces and providing enough information and access to the market is really going to help clean energy uh, not only expand, but expand in a way that's accessible to lots of people. And we really see opening up a market for renters, for low-income people, for communities that have traditionally been left out of the clean energy conversation and market uh, is, is really going to help in this transformation. Um, and the other piece that I think is really important is for us it's not about just doing this because this is a good thing to do. We know that um, uh, in order to meet our climate goals, in order to really be an example for the rest of the country, we have to have a clean energy economy that works for everyone, that is accessible to everyone, um, regardless of income and, and really regardless of where you live geographically in the state. Um, as I'm sure you can assume, uh, as I'm sure, you know, it, it's, 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 um, it's not very surprising to know that most of the solar thus far has been coastal, has been in wealthier um, uh, upper and middle class neighborhoods. Uh, but we can't get there on just uh, focusing on one market alone. And so EDF has been really uh, striving to uh, really open up as many markets as possible and to create the best kind of a clean energy ecosystem where that really works for everyone. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jorge. I think we are about to take a break. And when we come back, we will pick up with uh, Jorge Madrid from the Environmental Defense Fund on Community Renewable Power. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi with the Think Tech Hawaii show, Stacy to the Rescue, highlighting some of Hawaii's issues. You can catch it at Think Tech Hawaii on Mondays at 11 a.m. Aloha. See you then. Hi, I'm Stan Energy Man, and I want you to be here every Friday. Noon. ThinkTechHawaii.com. Watch the show. Be there. I pity the fool who ain't. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I serve as senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on ThinkTech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting ThinkTech. Aloha. I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland every Friday here on ThinkTech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kauilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Hello, and welcome back to Power Up Hawaii. I am your host, Raya Salter. We are talking today about clean and renewable energy for everyone with Jorge Madrid, Climate and Energy Campaign Manager for the Environmental Defense Fund based in Los Angeles. Hello again, Jorge. Hello. So, before we went to break, you were talking about the importance of having uh, clean and renewable energy be for everyone and really expanding markets to get beyond this idea that clean and renewable energy is only for the wealthy. You also did a great job telling, of, uh, telling us about the myriad of benefits that a low-income community can derive from a clean and renew renewable power, be it a financial, be it um, uh, health and safety-wise in terms of reduced um, carbon emissions and co-pollutants. So that means we've got, it, uh, you know, so here we are, we're at one place now, and we've got to get to a new place, a new place where everybody has access to clean and renewable power. So that must mean engaging communities, engaging people in place where they are. So I'd be interested to hear more about what you and the Environmental Defense Fund are doing um, in California to engage communities with, these, with this work. Well, I can talk about my work here in Los Angeles because that's really what I've been mostly focused on. Uh, I work with several coalitions here in the community. Um, and these coalitions are very diverse. They're folks that are uh, focused on social justice, economic justice, environmental justice. Um, you know, EDF is a large, what you'd call mainstream environmental organization. And uh, I think that we're probably not as well equipped as these community organizations to understand the needs of the community um, and also to really have that level of trust that needs to be built in. 
I mean, one of the important things to remember is that, uh, you know, a lot of these clean energy products and programs have been marketed at households with other kinds of profiles. Um, and, you know, a lot of households, frankly, are, are, a little sh are a little concerned about getting into a new financial agreement with a clean energy company trying to sell them something. So that, I that issue of trust and that issue of uh, really understanding the sort of needs uh, of a particular community are so important. And so to that end, we really made a strong emphasis on partnering with those community-based organizations. Now, those community-based organizations are very aware of the real dangers of climate change, but they also understand that their constituents, the, the, their, their community, my own community, uh, have a lot of other needs, again, like jobs, like economic development, like breathing clean air, access to clean energy, food, um, a lot of the things that sort of are part of this package of, of what really it means to have a sustainable community. Uh, and in that way, I think EDF is both able to bring resources and bring technical know-how, but also to learn. And that exchange has been a, a very powerful one for me and for a large organization like EDF. Uh, and I think it really needs to be the new model that uh, private sector, nonprofit sector, and community sector is really able to work together. Uh, to achieve these solutions. That, I, I couldn't agree more. I'm excited to hear that this is happening, that it's happening with Environmental Defense Fund. I will note, caveat, I am an alum, a proud alum of Environmental Defense Fund. I was a regulatory attorney with EDF uh, several years ago. Um, but that caveat aside, that's very exciting. Can you um, tell us, Jorge, what's an example of how, where the rubber meets the road when you guys actually go out and work with your communities, our communities, um, to make these changes happen and develop these markets? Well, I'll tell you a really fun example. Um, and it's an event that we have, uh, has become a yearly event. It's called Eastside Soul. It is an event that is, uh, on its surface, it's a big party, right? And it's a big party powered by solar. Uh, we bring in large solar generators to sort of have this off-grid food trek, uh, art and music festival. We invite the entire community. Because if you really wanted to do something and you wanted to get folks from the community out, you got to have good food. You have to have, good food. <laughs> you have to have a good time. Now, while they're there, we bring out plenty of resources, information, clean and en clean energy demonstration projects um, to really show the community these are the technologies that are out there. And um, one of the things that we want to do is sort of take away the mystery that you really need to be a uh, wealthy homeowner or you have to fit the profile of an environmentalist, um, which is not really something that a lot of folks in marginalized communities can identify with, right? Hugging the trees and the polar bears and the baby seals. Um, we really make a strong connection that clean energy solutions uh, and other solutions related to a healthy environment like good food, clean water, transportation, um, is something that can really benefit them. But one of the other things that's important about this is that we also want to honor the fact that for a lot of these communities, they've been living sustainably for a long time. Things like doing carpools, growing your own food, um, you know, really sort of living small and compact and with a small carbon fr footprint. Those are things that, you know, may be trending now to sort of the eco hipster environmentalist, but it's something that these communities have been practicing for a long time. So we also want to honor those things while introducing new technologies. And, and the last thing I'll say about this is that the outcome of these events, these that we've had now for the last two years and have been really fun, there's actually been real policy change because I think that our elected leaders are seeing that these community groups um, also are demanding solutions and solutions that work for them. And community solar and shared renewables is one of those solutions that's gonna work for them um, and, and really sort of expand the, the reach of, uh, of our clean energy goals. What are some of the key challenges um, to uh, community renewables? Well, I think for one, you, it has to make sense financially. So if you're opting into a community renewables program um, and, and, and uh, you know, we would like low income folks, renters to be able to access these, it has to make sense financially. So, um, you know, right now there is a uh, sort of a need to bring down those costs and to be able to reach scale so that it become 
can become more affordable. But you know, the other thing that's really important is we want to make sure that we em emphasize energy efficiency and sort of behavioral changes so that along with receiving um, clean energy at a fixed cost, so meaning as energy prices increase, the cost of this community solar program and the energy uh, produced is going to remain fixed, uh, that they're also able to save energy while they're doing that. Uh, and that's a tricky thing to do. And so, you know, we're working that out. There's lots of programs around the country which is trying to figure out that correct price point. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is the marketing and actually getting folks to sign up. And I think some of that goes to the trust issues, that goes to the issues of folks maybe not necessarily seeing themselves as an environmentalist. And what we're trying to do is change that sort of stigma and say this is for everyone and this is something that um, you can afford and also a way for you to contribute to your community growing stronger. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. What are some of the sort of key outtakes or key lessons um, that if you were looking at a jurisdiction like Hawaii, we've got the highest energy prices in the country, we have tremendous energy poverty, we have a lot of folks living in multifamily buildings, um, particularly on Oahu. What are some of the lessons you think that we could take from some of the good stuff that's happening in California? Sure. I mean, one thing is that you need many different kinds of solutions to fit different kinds of needs. And so, um, you know, you have your traditional sort of net metering, feed in tariff, power purchase agreements, other kinds of policies that really make sense for an upper middle class homeowner that has a newer house. But you also need shared renewables. And I'd like to add things like shared storage, uh, uh, you know, access to energy efficiency programs. Um, to really be able to fit the different kinds of needs of different kinds of customers. And, and, and that's really important. Uh, I would say the other thing that is probably equally important and that we're starting to really see in California is it's not a, just about sticking a bunch of solar power, um, you know, and, and that solving all of your problems. You also have to solve for what time of day is that energy demand happening. And that demand, you know, that we have new technologies like the Nest thermostat, we have batteries, and we have just good old fashioned behavioral change that can help align the demand for that energy during the time when we're actually producing the most sun. Um, and so it's a technology issue, but it's also really sort of a education and outreach issue as well. Thank you so much, Jorge. Here in Hawaii, uh, we are on the cutting edge on a lot of these issues. We are in the midst of um, developing our community renewables tariff. And I think that, I think there's a lot that we can learn from uh, the work that you're doing. Um, and I think, wouldn't it be great if we could have, uh, we could create connections and have some, uh, some cultural exchanges some arts and music and share some of these um, techniques that can move communities forward and make communities stronger. Uh, because I think that um, here in Hawaii, as we uh, engage communities and think about what our needs and solutions look like, um, that that could also offer lessons to California. Um, this is just extremely um, exciting that this project is um, moving forward um, in California. Do you have any last thoughts you'd like to share with us, Jorge? I sure do. I mean, first of all, I'm so honored to be here and I'm so inspired by the work that is happening in Hawaii and in other states local municipalities, that's where the real leadership is coming from. I think a lot of us are looking to, uh, you know, what is our clean energy future going to look like moving forward? And I would say that what gives me hope and that what really gives me a lot of optimism is that the real innovation and the real problem solving and solution is going to come from the state, local and regional level. And all of these examples are going to help teach us and we're going to learn together how to get there in a way that is uh, uh, the right cost, but also the way that has the levels of equity and uh, inclusion that we need. Well, thank you so much for joining us in California, Jorge. Um, I look forward to including you in more discussions going forward. Um, and uh, just thank you for sharing your work and your success and your vision. And I wish you the very best of luck with this incredible new pilot project that has been approved for community renewables in Los Angeles. Thank you, Raya. It was great to be here. So 
That is the end of our show today. Thank you so much for joining me, Raya Salter, for Power Up Hawaii, and also my guest, Jorge Madrid. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ooh, thank you guys for bearing with me.